Christina Chan is Professor of Chemical Engineering at Michigan State University with a joint appointment in Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. She obtained her bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Columbia and a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Pennsylvania. So the Lions and the Quakers. After working at DuPont for eight years, she was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard for in the uh, medical school's Center for Engineering and Medicine, uh, where she studied lipid metabolism in the bioartificial liver, uh, in the bioartificial bio liver assist device. Professor Chan has been a leader in promoting multidisciplinary research between engineers and biological scientists to solve biomedical challenges. Professor Chan's group is dedicated to developing and applying bioinformatics and systems biology techniques to understanding the development of diseases and identifying drug targets and disease biomarkers, especially for liver cancer and Alzheimer's disease. Her group is also developing polymeric-based drug delivery and tissue engineering platforms to modulate pathways for treating these diseases. She's going to explain all that in the next few minutes. She has published over 130 peer-reviewed journal articles, reviews, and book chapters, and 240 invited and conference papers and presentations. She has been recognized for her research contributions over the years, as evidenced by her invitation to the National Academy of Engineering's Frontiers in Engineering in 2004, and her election to Fellow of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering, AIMBE, in 2012. She has mentored over 60 undergraduates in research projects in her lab over the last 14 years at MSU, about half of whom were women. These undergraduates have gone on to graduate and medical school and also into industrial positions in chemical engineering, pharmaceutical, and biotech companies. Welcome, Christina. Um, good morning, and thank you for the in introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to share with you some of the uh, biomedical research that's ongoing in our uh, laboratory. So uh, the research in our lab actually uh, encompasses three uh, uh, focus. The uh, three focuses are computation, biology, and technology. So in our lab, we develop as well as use computation models to analyze the data and to provide new insights into the rules of biology, which then requires, if we want to further investigate these new insights, that we develop uh, new technologies. So one of the focus in our laboratory is to try and understand the role of environmental factors in the development and progression of diseases such as Alzheimer's and liver uh, cancer. We know that, um, as, or it's been suggested in uh, epidemiological studies, that um, obesity is uh, highly associated or linked with a liver tumor genesis and increased mortality, as well as a number of other diseases. However, we actually analyzed um, liver samples from cancer patients and found that uh, BMI is not, act, is not um, uh, associated or is not a very good predictor of the progression of liver cancer. Instead, what we did identify was a scavenge, scavenger receptor protein that is involved in taking up fatty acid that is um, a good predictor and furthermore, uh, contributes to the progression of liver cancer. And so that highlights the uh, importance of gene-environment interactions in the progression of diseases. And so to understand the role of these environmental factors, our group also uh, developed computational models. So the idea there is to, to ask the question, how do the network of pathways change to uh, to uh, give you the particular phenotype that you see in order to uh, identify, in our case, novel pathways that could be potential biomarkers as well as drug targets. And so to, to really uh, determine whether these pathways have uh, disease-modifying effects typically requires one to perform animal or cell culture studies. Now, one of the issues uh, with cell culture studies, or rather with uh, in vivo animal studies, is the fact that you have a lot of complex interactions that go on that make it very difficult to assess the, the ex exact contributions of the pathway that you're trying to study. However, when you look at cell culture study, the limitation is, or the challenge is that oftentimes the response you get in a cell culture study doesn't necessarily correlate well with in vivo response. 
So one of the things that our lab is working on developing are these biomimetic systems that can take into account cell-cell and cell surface interactions so that they can better re recapitulate the microenvironment so that now when we uh, test these uh, pathways, it would uh, better be able to uh, correlate with the responses that you see in vivo. So in the next three slides, what I'd like to do is uh, briefly cover some of the uh, projects that um, were performed or, or ongoing in our lab. So one has to do with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's. So currently, the uh, way to uh, conclusively determine whether a patient has Alzheimer's disease is by analyzing the biomarkers in the brains of postmortem AD brains, which is a little difficult to do with live patients. And so now, um, the typical approach that people use is a more qualitative approach of cognitive uh, tests, which essentially is one, uh, for example, the mini mental uh, state exam, which is a questionnaire that is used to uh, assess a patient's uh, memory, uh, attitude, and language skills, for example. And so the, the, the challenge there is that once you take those exams, it can tell you that the patient may have uh, dementia, but it doesn't necessarily distinguish whether the person has AD or some other form of dementia. So alternatively, there is another approach where you can take cerebral, uh, cere uh, cerebral spinal fluid from the patient and analyze the biomarkers, which is a, a more conclusive in determining whether a patient has AD. However, it is a highly invasive procedure. And so what we've done is we've taken samples, um, post-mortem samples from 80 patients and have found that there are these uh, biomarkers or microRNAs that are involved in regulating a lipid pathway that is uh, highly reduced in the brains of 80 patients. And surprisingly, what we found was that these same biomarkers are also significantly reduced in the blood serum of, of, of patients of 80 patients. So that suggests that perhaps this could be a potential viable, non-invasive uh, way to diagno diagnose whether a person has AD. So now shifting gears a little bit, another project that we're actually uh, performing now that we're uh, very excited about uh, involves uh, CRISPR technology, or gene editing, if you will, um, applied to Parkinson's disease. And so case studies have shown that when you uh, take fetal grafts and transplant them into the brains of uh, Parkinson's disease patients, that uh, a large percentage of these patients develop a, a certain side effect, which is these involuntary muscle movements. So it turns out when they uh, went back to look, they realized that the reason for that is the, in the transplanted region, the, the brain cells are not necessarily just producing dopamine, which is what's missing in PD patients, but also other neurotransmitters such as uh, serotonin. And so what we're trying to do is to use uh, CRISPR technology or gene editing uh, to edit out in neural stem cells their ability to pr produce some of these other uh, off-target, if, if you will, neurotransmitters. So the idea is that then if you transplant these edited um, stem cells into the brain of PD patients, they will then produce just dopamine. Okay. Um, and the uh, uh, last project that I want to uh, briefly touch upon is a project that came about uh, last year while I was at, on sabbatical at uh, Columbia University. And so here the idea is to develop an enzymatic uh, particle for detoxification. And so the idea is that if someone were to inadvertently or purposefully be exposed to a high level of toxins, such as, let's say, dioxin, uh, insecticides, or even drugs, or any molecules that can be used as a threat agent, the idea is can we uh, develop these enzymatic particles that can be injected into the patient to, de uh, to detoxify these high levels of, of toxin. Now, current approaches that are used uh, to address these threat agents are either what they call stoichiometric or catalytic um, scavengers. So with the stoichiometric scavengers, they, ha they can um, uh, detoxify a wide range of nerve gas agents, for example, nerve agents. Um, the, the limitation is that when it uh, binds one of these molecules, it becomes deactivated. So the decontamination capacity is somewhat limited. So alternatively, there are these catalytic 
uh, scavengers, which have multiple uh, functional sites that can bind many more of these molecules. But the limitation that these catalytic uh, uh, scavengers have is that they can only detoxify a very narrow uh, range of compounds. And so the, the approach that we're taking is to, is to capitalize upon a particular enzyme that's in the liver that is normally able to metabolize and detoxify a whole range of chemicals. And so that uh, in addition to the breadth of, of chemicals that they can um, detoxify, one of the challenges that we're addressing to make this a viable solution is to be able to uh, regenerate the cofactor that is required to maintain the activity of, the, of this enzyme. So that uh, essentially this enzyme will be able to have limited capacity for decon decontamination. And so, so that pretty much um, summarizes uh, three of the, the uh, ongoing projects in our laboratory. So with that, I want to uh, uh, say that um, for biomedical uh, research right now at MSU, we are at a very exciting uh, period in MSU's history with the hiring of Professor Chris Kontag to lead the institute and the biomedical engineering department. Now, one of the um, strengths of MSU and what attracted me to MSU is their long, long tradition for open, of, towards openness to collaboration across colleges. And so I have had the pleasure and opportunity or fortune to interact with a whole host of uh, uh, investigators across our campus, some of whom are listed on this page. Now, in closing, I would like to acknowledge the graduate students and a small portion of the um, undergraduate students, including two high school students, that have, uh, along with the funding sources, that have contributed significantly to the, success, to the success of this laboratory. And in particular, I'd like to highlight Irene Lee, who I believe presented to this board this past April uh, to, to discuss some of her research uh, as undergraduate student in our laboratory. And so with that, I thank you for your attention and we'll be happy to answer any questions.